On December 16, 1773, at Griffin's Wharf in Boston, Massachusetts, a group of hundreds of patriots who were looking to serve up a fine brew of tea and seawater marched onto three ships and began a hard night's work of unloading freight from the ship straight into the cold seawater. Surprisingly, there were no fights and no violence at all. Even a lock that was damaged was replaced by the Patriots the next day. There were no reports of bagels accompanying the lock. This was one of the biggest steps forward into what would eventually be called the American Revolution. It was the beginning of the great American mythology. Timescape image works, America the Great. What makes America great? Is it the people, the places, the culture, or its mythological events? Like all good things, it's the coming together of all those things. Today, we will discover the American mythology of the Boston Tea Party. Chapter 1, The Boston Tea Party. Today in Boston, the intersection of Congress and Purchase Streets may be full of cars and pedestrians, but it looked far different over 250 years ago, before large amounts of land expansion filling in parts of the harbor. On December 16, 1773, it was a cool night when hundreds of men dressed as Mohawks or Narragansett Indians and wearing plenty of war paint made from soot to hide their faces took to three commercial ships owned by the floundering British East India Company. Those three ships, the Eleanor, the Dartmouth, which must be better than a dartboard mouth, and the Beaver. Gee, Wally. These ships were filled with tea, not Texas tea, but tax tea. The worst kind of tea. Why would you need a tax for tea anyway? It's not like you want to stick it on a wall. The Indian dress, however, was more about hiding their identities to prevent punishment than anything else. But it also sent a signal that they were siding with the Americans, not the British. The style of clothes was not actually true Indian, as they wore wool blankets, match coat style, carried hatchets or tomahawks, and pistols, and used soot to paint their faces, and some donned other types of wear that would be recognized as Indian dress. But a lot of it was similar to what soldiers wore during the French and Indian War. The whole event would only take around three hours. Not bad considering they did it without the benefit of a caffeine rush. They started on the ships around 7 p.m. and were done near 10 p.m., according to eyewitnesses. It may have been a Thursday, but the men treated it like a Friday night on the town. Something to remember about those three ships. All of them were built in America and owned by Americans. It's true the cargo of tea they were carrying was from London and was owned by the British East India Company but not the ships. Both the Beaver and the Dartmouth were constructed and owned by the Roches, a rich Nantucket Quaker family, whereas the Eleanor was owned by a wealthy Boston merchant named John Rowe. Yes, that does make the Eleanor an example of row, row, row your boat, and was just one of several of the Rowe vessels. For those who like their stories complicated and are ready to take notes, the ships were American-built and owned, but chartered by the English and the East Indian tea they were carrying was from China, not India. Who were these hundreds of men who tossed the 342 chest of tea into the harbor? First off, most remained unknown for several years after the event, as secrecy was necessary to ensure safety. We do know of 116 that were actually documented to have participated in the dumping, but the rest remained undocumented, living in the shadows, hoping for sanctuary for just a chance at a normal life, but are still a secret to this day. We do know that it was a group of all men from all stations of life, and while most were Bostonians, some were from other parts of the colony and even neighboring Maine. The largest group of them were of English blood, but there were Irish, Scots, Africans, and Portuguese involved as well. While the men differed in age, most of the documented were under 40. Nine were older than 40, while 16 were only teenagers. After the event, a great deal of them left Boston immediately to avoid being arrested. There were thousands who witnessed the tea party, and though few, if any, knew it, it was on those ships all of them began the long road 
to the American Revolution. Chapter 2. What caused all these men to go through all this effort? By the 1760s, the debt in Britain had been building, and Parliament decided it could lower the burden by taxing the American colonists. The concept of printing money with nothing to back it up and getting their chicks for free would be centuries away. First they implemented the Stamp Act in 1765, where nearly every piece of printed paper, from legal papers to playing cards, even newspapers and more, were hit with the tax. Luckily, toilet paper was exempt from the tax, not just because people don't like their bottom to touch tax, but because it hadn't been invented yet. This was followed by the Townshend Acts in 1767, which taxed not just paper, but paint, lead, glass, and, yes, tea. Britain reasoned that such taxes were in balance with money on fighting wars on the colonists' behalf. It was not a shared opinion by many colonists. Colonists demanded to be led into Parliament to be represented, but Britain was having none of that. This is where Samuel Adams and John Hancock, who were both tea smugglers making profits off of avoiding the tax by smuggling, came in to create and promote the phrase taxation without representation, in order to win over fellow colonists in a way that would not only promote a stronger unified political force, but was also good enough for the pocketbooks of smugglers and regular colonists alike. It was also short enough they could have put it on a bumper sticker for the boats and carriages. The good news was the protests got most of the taxes removed. Hooray! The bad news was Britain held tight to the tea tax, Rats! both in the colonies and in England. Oh! Britain was in no mood to let go of the income from colonists' 1.2 million pounds of tea consumed each year by the colonists. The colonists had a better chance of getting the tea out of the alphabet than out of the tax code. Boycotts were taken against the British East India Company, and smuggling Dutch tea became big business. Parliament had a plan for this, too. In 1773, the Tea Act was passed, and now the British East India Company could sell tea duty-free, because no one wants duty mixed in with their tea. And this maneuver didn't stop John Hancock or Samuel Adams from increasing their smuggling, but it did put a crimp on their ability to compete in the market. The two pushed the idea of taxation without representation even harder on those around them. This type of propaganda had been going on since at least the Boston Massacre three years earlier. That event started on March 5, 1770. Several colonists had been harassing a red-coat British soldier. The soldier was then granted help by other soldiers, and they found themselves being pelted by snowballs, garbage, and rocks from angry colonists, proving these kinds of things don't just happen at music concerts. Eventually, shots were fired, killing five colonists and wounding six more. The propaganda of the incident came out in full force and distorted greatly what happened and how it happened. In other words, fake news was everywhere, and it spread like lightning through the colonial news network. This is CNN. The colonists were in a fury over what they were told happened. This set the stage for the Tea Party and the march towards independence and revolution. Chapter 3. The Sons of Liberty Samuel Adams and John Hancock were among two of the major leaders of the Sons of Liberty, a secret group put together of colonial merchants and trademen that started as a bulwark against the Stamp Act and other tax acts that followed. The group included many famous revolutionaries and founding fathers, like Paul Revere and even Benedict Arnold, the infamous turncoat. Hooray! I'm for the other team! There was a meeting held at the Old South Meeting House before the action to vote what to do. A majority of the colonists voted to refuse paying the new taxes on the tea, as well as unload the ships or store or sell the tea. However, Governor Thomas Hutchinson demanded the ships remain and be unloaded, and the tea tariff paid, and he would not compromise with the colonists. This meant they were called to arms to toss the China tea from the three ships. You can decide what's worse, being called two arms or four eyes, but being called to arms is different than using those two arms. The raid and dump was now on, and the men took their action hidden in their Indian disguises. The disguises worked for everyone but Francis Ackley, who was arrested and imprisoned. There was another, who for some time was thought to be killed by being hit in the head, in the hold of a ship by a crate in motion. Instead, John Crane is reported to have been taken by others to a nearby carpenter shop and buried under wood shavings. No wonder you have to watch your step when the chips are down. When he woke up, he fled to safety. He was the only person in the entire event that was harmed, and it was an accident by other patriots. 
so John Crane was knocked out by swinging stuff around on a ship. No wonder there's so much crane safety now. Chapter 4 How Did the Tea Party Unfold? When the men finally arrived at the pier, the three leaders began to peel off their teams of men into one of three groups, one for each ship. No one knew the names of anyone there, except their own commander, to protect all from prosecution. This made reunions difficult, but masquerade parties easier. When the men arrived, they were surrounded by armed British ships, yet none of the officials did anything to stop the ruckus. After boarding the ships, the keys to the hatch were requested and given from the different captains. The orders were given to open the hatches, then use the tomahawks to cut open or split the tea chest, before tossing them overboard to make certain the seawater ruined the tea. They were counting on no one wanting tea that was salt tea. There were at least two rascals who were grabbing some of the tea to make it their own. One, who pocketed the stuff and fled, all the while being chased and kicked by the Sons of Liberty, and another older man who put it in his hat, only to have a Son of Liberty take the tea, the hat, and his wig, and toss them all overboard, sparing the old man the same fate due to his age. The old man lost both his English tea and his booty, but was left with a little of his dignity due to the Sons of Liberty. Maybe the most shocking thing of the whole affair is that the historical records show no examples of damage upon any of the three ships, except the one padlock that was replaced the next day by one of the Patriots. Yes, the one without the bagels. This is far from the actions that were taken by the Sons of Liberty towards other people, like boycotts and public demonstrations, some leading to quite a bit of violence and looting. This event was specifically planned and played out with the intent of causing no harm to person or property, minus the tea, of course. There was nothing beyond the tea that was stolen or looted, and even more alarming was how the Sons of Liberty and crew swept the decks of the ships and made certain any disturbed items were placed back where they were before the boarding of the ships. The three ships' crews all swore that no damage had been taken on the vessels except to the crates of tea. The wrecking crew was also the cleaning crew, and the only thing they forgot was to put a chocolate candy on the captain's pillows. Maybe this is a good time to remember all the ships were American-owned and operated, not British. They were merely hired for carrying British cargo for transport. As quickly and slyly as they had all arrived, so too the men exited, leaving many of the ship's crews to wonder, who were those masked men? Chapter 5. Cost of the Tea Party With the weight of 90,000 pounds of tea in their chests tossed overboard, the damage in 1773 English currency, 9,659 pounds. The cost today would be over a million dollars in damages in American currency. One million dollars. Or less than a millisecond of the U.S. national debt today. That's over 18 and a half million tea bags the Sons of Liberty served up that Thursday night. One can only guess how the tea affected the sea life. How many dolphins and seals not only couldn't sleep for days but had the jitters. And what about turtles who had so much caffeine in them that they were daring rabbits on the shore to a race? And even without the help of Aesop, now they actually had a chance of winning. Chapter 6. Aftermath The day after the raids, men were sent out into the harbor to destroy any remaining floating crates or tea using their oars and paddles until it was certain no tea could be recovered. They were given the orders to beat it. Just beat it. No one wants to be defeated. Something many didn't think about was after all the tea was dumped into the harbor, it would be weeks of stench wafting through the air and nearby areas from the handiwork of the raiders. We've got to get out of this stench! No! Burst. It was enough to make some think there was a convention of the French in town. What an incredible smell you've discovered! In retaliation, the British shut down the Boston Harbor until all the destroyed tea was paid for. This was called the Boston Port Act. This would be one of many forthcoming British retaliations in 1774 for the colonists' show of force. As for the raiders who tossed the tea, or as the event was called by the Bostonians for the first 50 years, the destruction of the tea event, only one man was found and punished, while many of the other participants remain anonymous to this day. The man, who was given up by a secret tipster, was stripped down and then tarred and feathered. It's all fun and games until you look like the worst barbecued chicken in the colony and have the burn scars to go with it. 
Even then, Bostonians looked down on people who use fossil fuels. There were no more names provided after that. It was just the sounds of silence. Chapter 7. Public Reaction The reaction to the event was mixed with the general public and leaders alike. John Adams, cousin to Samuel Adams, was in the group who were elated at the destruction of the tax tea and the suffering it meant for the British crown. George Washington, who was not yet in service as a revolutionary, was in the other camp. He was with those who held the idea that an assault on private property was not something to be taken lightly or approved of. It was sacrosanct. You might say it was just something he couldn't really sink his teeth into. Washington believed the men should be paid back for the destruction of the tea, while agreeing Britain did deserve to be taken to task. Benjamin Franklin was so outraged, he offered to pay back the British East India Company himself to right the wrong. Franklin famously said, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, but apparently a tea in the sea was just too confusing even for him. He was rich enough at the time to be able to do it, and he wanted the harbor back open as much as everyone else, but his offer was refused, and so there was never compensation. Maybe Parliament hadn't heard about the bird in the hand yet, even after the Patriots had now showed them the bird. Chapter 8 The Mostly Forgotten Sequels The Boston Tea Party was not the only time Patriots tossed tax tea. No, there is another. There would be some tea parties to follow, not just in Boston, but in Maryland, South Carolina, and New York as well. But like so many sequels, the fame and glory gets less with each one that came later like Marvel in D.C. The first follow-up was in March 1774, just four months later, inclusive of December, where somewhere near 60 Bostonians dumped around 30 more tea chests into the harbor again, leaving the ship the fortune a bit less fortunate. It was this follow-up that caused the copycat smash-and-grabs in the other colonies. It was not just dumping tea overboard, though. At some of these follow-ups, there were times where they would also burn the tea, showing some Americans will smoke anything. Chapter 9. Britain's Response. The Empire Strikes Back. The Crown did not take kindly to the loss of money or attitude of the colonist. King George III in Parliament created the Retaliatory Coercive Acts, which the colonists would rename to the Intolerable Acts. They included closed Boston Harbor until the tea lost in the Boston Tea Party was paid for. In the Massachusetts Constitution, and ended free elections of town officials. Moved authority to Britain and British judges, basically creating martial law in Massachusetts. Required colonists to quarter British troops on demand. Extended freedom of worship to French Canadian Catholics under British rule, which angered the mostly Protestant colonists. But they never followed through with their threat of no shoes, no shirt, no service. Probably a wise choice in Boston. Like King Edward I, Old Longshanks, did with Scotland, George III tried again with the same tactics on the colonies. Punish them into submission and keep them from uniting. However, George got the same result Edward did. Unification and full-on rebellion. Don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. The colonies saw the taxes and actions of the crown as proof of tyranny, and now the normally independent colonies were pulling together to back Massachusetts in the rebellion. Before the coercive acts, people like George Washington and others, who thought the Tea Party went too far, were now united in thinking Britain had gone too far. That's all I can stand! I can't stand this no more! The next step taken by the colonists was to continue protest and also call together the First Continental Congress in September and October of 1774 in order to find a way to repeal the coercive acts or as the colonists now called them, the Intolerable Acts. You're despicable! The dominoes of revolution were falling faster than free chicken nuggets at a body-positive meeting, and all in place to lead to eventual breaking off and creation of the United States. Though the people at the time didn't know it, the revolution was on, and the first shots fired to make it official would happen not so far away in Lexington and Concord on April the 19th, 1775, two years later, after the Boston Tea Party. Chapter 10, The Boston Tea Party on Film. Here are some of the films about the Boston Tea Party according to IMDb. 
If you haven't seen Walt Disney's Johnny Tremaine, it's well worth the watch. It tells the story as close to the facts as one could hope from Hollywood. If you do watch it, and you see the Liberty Tree in it, that's the one Thomas Jefferson liked to talk about. And so did a lot of other patriots. So the Redcoats cut it down. Independence showed them. Thank you for watching. We hope you enjoyed this presentation of America the Great, the Boston Tea Party. Thank you.